From Day to DeRocher to Patkin, it's double play with DeRocher and Day. With their guest, Max Patkin, here's another chapter of Double Play with DeRocher and Day. Welcome to another visit with baseball's most exciting and controversial couple, Lorraine Day and Leo DeRocher, with their guest for today, Max Patkin. However, before we join Lorraine and Leo, here's an important message. And now back to Double Play with Leo DeRocher and Lorraine Day and their guest, Max Patkin. However, before we join Leo and Lorraine, we've asked a very famous West Coast baseball writer whose daily column appears in the Los Angeles Examiner to come into our studios and tell you listeners a little bit about the background of our special guest, Max Patkin. And he is the well-known sports writer, Bob Hunter. Bob, come on in. Well, Frank, did you ever think Ichabod Crane would come to life? You know, this is a very apt simile, too, between he and Ichabod Crane. Max Patkin. Well, I can kid a little bit about Max, uh, Frank, because I've known him a long time. He's a good friend of mine, mm -hmm. and he does look like Ichabod Crane, and he takes great uh, pride in, in putting on uh, antics like uh, we, as kids, would imagine Ichabod Crane to, to do. He's my, like a four-legged stork, I think. He's tall and skinny, uh -huh. and he's got an Adam's apple that, that, that uh, bobs around. All you can see in his neck is, a, is a sort of an Adam's apple, uh -huh. and he's... Um, I say four-legged stork because he stands on his head almost as much as he does his feet, and he's got those big long arms and long legs, and he looks back between his legs and around under his arms and and uh, seems like he's standing off balance, like you've seen those fellas on the stage do with those yeah. big long stilts on their feet, yeah. uh, Frank, but he does it with just his baseball shoes on, and he's really, really a funny fella. Bob, tell me a little bit about Max and how he got started in this uh particular profession. Well, uh, uh, Max used to be a ball player, Frank. He wasn't a real good ball player, but he had a lot of uh, what you call ham in him, I guess. He was a, a, the clown of the clubhouse, uh -huh. and uh, as long as he couldn't be a good top ball player, he figured, well, I'm going to make uh, uh, money in this uh, business some way, mm -hmm. and uh, so he became more and more of a clown, and I think it was really Bill Beck that started him on his way up the ladder, uh, so to speak, in this business. I think uh, Max must make himself uh, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year now touring around on different uh, clubs. Do you suppose the reason that uh, Max got started in this was to amuse the fans, or was it to uh, kind of disturb the opposing players? Well, I think primarily it was to make some money for himself, but then <laughs> after that it was, uh, I think, to upset the opposing players. Uh, Bill hired him to go out in the coaching line and do all these funny things in dull ball games. Well, that was uh, uh, good enough, but uh, Max would be out there doing them sometimes when they're playing the uh, New York Yankees in Yankee Stadium. <laughs> of course, the Browns would be down in the cellar, the Yankees would be fighting for that pennant, yeah. but still uh, uh, Max would be out there doing these uh, funny things. They weren't funny to the Yankees. One game, it uh, cost Allie Reynolds a ball game. He uh, started looking at Max, and he couldn't take his eye off of him, all those uh, funny gyrations, which he yeah. really can do, twisting himself all around. And the fans were watching uh, Max, too, and it upset Allie so much that he actually fell off the mound there once making a pitch. Probably later on in the program, Max will explain about the midget that uh, Bill Beck ran into a yeah, game. Bill, uh, as you know, uh, Frank has done a lot of things like that. He's called the, uh, oh, all sorts of names, the Barnum and Bailey of baseball, and I yeah. think he lives up to that name. You know, when he had the uh, Cleveland uh, Club, uh, oh, I think it was 48, the year they won the pennant, why he said, uh, we're going to win the pennant, and if you don't believe me, I'm going to hire a flagpole sitter to get up there on the, that flagpole and sit there until we do win the pennant. Mm. And... Uh, I'm uh, happy to say he hired a patient soul because he was up there almost two months, but they finally did. <laughs> they finally won the pennant, Frank, in that uh -huh. year, as you'll remember. Well, anybody who would put uh, Max Patkin on his payroll certainly is a showman. Or... That's why he did it, and it's paid off because it not only draws uh, when they're at home, but uh, when the club was on the road, you know, uh, they take Max along, and people would come out to see Max Patkin. They wouldn't come out to see sometimes the St. Louis Browns so much yeah. uh, when they were down or uh, perhaps some other club, but they come out to see Max Patkin uh, well, he certainly is a fascinating person and one that I know that our listeners are very anxious to meet. Thank you very much, Bob Hunter, West Coast sports writer whose daily column appears in the Los Angeles Examiner for being our special guest today. I'm glad to be here, Frank. And now, fans, let's join our stars, Lorraine Day and Leo DeRocher, and their special guest for today, Max Patkin. And as we join them, it seems that Leo and Max have a little scheme cooked up to play on Lorraine. Let's listen. Hi, you fan. You know, I'm the manager of the New York Giants in name only. Lorraine is really the manager. At least that's what she thinks. You know, there's a young ball player out here that asked me for a tryout. He thinks he's good enough to make the Giants and play in the major leagues. Well, now, you have to have an interview with a player like that, and, of course, there are just a lot of things that you must know now, about. Now, Leo, since I'm going to interview uh, this Mr. Brown, there, these are the things I'm going to look for. Seriousness of purpose, style, form, experience disposition, and appearance. What kind of an outfit is this you're wearing? 
Leo, just because I tell you who to pitch is no reason that you can tell me what to wear. Leave Styles out of this and bring Mr. Brown in. I'm all ready. We're going to You're do really this. ready for him? Yes. You want me to, to bring him in? Yes, we're going to do this just in a business-like manner, the way it should be done when you interview a player. Don't forget now, this is yours, and I want to see how smart you are. Oh, yes, I have it all down all right, here. I'll now, bring let's him see. In. Height, weight, habits, hobbies, girlfriends. Right. Now, this is Mr. Brown. How do you do? Mr. Drew. How do you do, Mr. Brown? Won't you sit down? Thank you. Now, let's see, Mr. Brown. Uh, what position do you play? All positions. Well, um, which position do you excel in? All positions. Well, which position do you prefer? All positions. Look, do you pitch? Do I pitch? Oh, she says do I pitch. Are you kidding? Leo, this guy is great. Oh, just He's a just minute. sensational. Just a minute. Do you know he has wait so much more what, than any other pitch driver? If just only he could hit. Can you hit? Can I hit? Oh, you, you've heard of Joe DiMaggio. I have a bat here that is just the thing. I've got it now. Go on, you can bring Mr. Patkin, too, now. You mean to tell me you knew who this was all well, the time? Of course. Everyone knows who Max Patkin of the St. Louis Browns is. How do you like that? I was born yesterday. I have a letter here to do with you. It's from Mr. Del Reeby, who is a Yankee fan, and he uh, seems to be very angry at you. Seems that you cost the Yankees a double header. You upset Mr. Reynolds. Well, I think that's a lie. I didn't upset Mr. Reynolds. You didn't? To hard of answer this young lady, why don't you get up here and give us a demonstration, Max, of exactly what you did while Reynolds was pitching? Will you do that for us? Well, I can give you an idea. All I mean, right, give me an idea. I, I don't see how this this can affect any ball game. All I do is go out there real serious, looking very intelligent on the coaching line. Now he's giving him the signs. He's taking the handkerchiefs out, giving him the signals. Hey, yeah, signaling. Now there's the way he does the coaching. You talking? Do you mean this is what you did against Mr. Reynolds? Yeah. Well, I don't blame Del Reby for being a little annoyed. I think this is very unfair. Why? Just a moment. Tell me, don't you think that this is unfair for you to do that on the coaching line in a well, ball game? Well, I don't know. I don't think it bothers anybody. Are you kidding? Well, wait a minute. Why is it unfair? After all, you start the ball game and you want to win, don't you? And if he's coaching for my club and he can distract the pitcher and make that pitcher wild or walk my hitters, I got a greater chance to win the ball game. Well, yes, I know. I mean, you Ooh. felt that way about Stanky in the uh, Philadelphia well, game doing the... Um... Uh, I see where that's a great help to his own club. Yes, but what do you think about it? Well, my opinion is this. So when I'm out there <clears throat> coaching, I don't like to be out there actually on a real tight ball game for one reason. I know just what it feels like when the game is say, going around the seventh inning and got a three and two pitch, and I'm going through some silly gyration. You hope the guy makes it ball four, though, don't you, Max? Yeah. Of course. Now, look, let me ask you one question. Has anyone ever said to you when the ball game's over, how did you come out? What do you say? If you've won the ball game, they never ask you how. They don't ask questions. Just ask who won. That's right. And that's all that counts. I want players on my club and coaches that want to win, that come to play and win the ball game. And if you can do that and disrupt the other club, you're the kind of guys I'd like to have working for me. Well, they're going to have to change all the rules then. And um, I have another letter here, too, about the St. Louis Browns that maybe you can answer. I don't know. Dorothy Keller wants to know about the midget that was used That's with it. the St. Louis Browns. Max, before you continue with the story, let's pause right here for an important announcement. And now back to Double Play with DeRocher and Day and their guest, Max Patkin. Well, Max, what about this midget? That must have been a funny bit when this little guy went up to the plate to hit. Well, it was, Leo. In fact, uh, everybody in the stands thought it was quite funny, too, when he came up and he was announced by the uh, public address system as uh, so-and-so batting, Gadel batting for so-and-so, and he went up the home plate. And you should have seen Kane out there. He didn't know what to do. He went into a fit almost. Was he the pitcher for <laughs> yeah, the Detroit? Bob Kane uh, yeah. for Detroit. And uh, Bob Kane got down, tried to be very precise with his pitching. He tried to, you know, sort of thread the needle, you know. Yeah, well, how about the catcher for you? Oh, Who was that? Bob was Swift was very serious, you know, and he was really <laughs> down. He got down low. That and, really must have been a funny you know, thing. He had a crink in his neck when he got up. I wish you could have seen it. <laughs> then when, when Gadel crouched down in the corner of that batter's box, yeah. and he, actually he was scared to death, and he was in the very corner of the box, and he was giving that. Of course, Kane couldn't get the ball over oh, the plate. I mean, yeah. Well, did he like ever it? get a strike over? Not a one. First three ball, boom, walk to start the inning. We had bases loaded, and we almost had a big inning. But the uh, funny thing, I think a double play took him right out of it. <laughs> <laughs> it was a funny bit. We could have used a couple of more midgets at that spot. I can think of some games when we could have used the midgets. Yeah. But n look, now honestly, do you really think that it's fair? I mean, so, the midget coming in, 
you coaching that way? I think it's fair. But well, wait a minute. I don't understand a question like that. I'll say that he's no more distracting in his clowning as long as he gives the signals than Jackie Robinson is in his face running. That's I right. I mean, that's certainly uh, distracting the pitcher enough, isn't it? If it's fair to distract the pitcher that way, why did they make Stanky quit the semaphoring behind uh, Well, because they, they just thought that he was exactly. jumping up and down on the defense and he had no business being behind there. They could say that about him, that he has no business there being There is no rule in the book, dear, that says that Stanky couldn't do that. But they made him stop. They made a rule and said that he had to stop. All right, what about the pitcher? Who was the pitcher that wore his sleeve in the long Well, that was in the spread. olden days. That was Dazzy Johnny Vance. Allen, and they made him he Johnny Allen. They made those fellas stop. Well, why? Well, because it's... What's the difference? Well, there's a distraction for the hitter. That oh, they it's, won't... it's not fair to distract the hitter, but it's okay to distract the pitcher. Well, I wouldn't say that. I say that you can't do things like that with part of your wearing apparel. Well, what about, there was a pitcher, an old-time pitcher, too, who had a big silver buckle, and he would go through maneuvers just to get the buckle to shine right now. Yes, but that was eyes. going back 75 or uh, 100 years ago, and that's Just when you far, were breaking in. Just when I was a youngster. I see. <laughs> well, anyway, I think... Uh, I meant to ask you, how, how did it feel about it against Alexander? Oh, now, wait a minute. <laughs> Come on, Max. I'm not that old. <laughs> well, what about it? Have you uh, got a giant uniform for Max? I know one thing. You can call what Max just did here clowning, kidding around... But if it distracts the other club enough that if he's coaching for me and can make my club win, I know that I've got a uniform that'll fit him. Then just why... Excuse us, this is a sort of a little uh, family argument. Go ahead. Did you, when we were in Miami, and we were playing the Brooklyn Dodgers, that exhibition, exhibition game, game yeah. and I got mad at the umpire and jumped up and screamed and hollered in the box, everything I could think of, you know, even if it's a very bad decision, why did you come over and put your hands on your hips and say, will you shut up? I was the, distracting everybody in the stand. For the simple reason that that game meant nothing. It was an exhibition game. Well, it still meant something to me. It meant something to you, but you couldn't holler at the umpire in an this exhibition game. all very confusing about when you can distract and when you can't distract. We have arrived at nothing. Anyway, thank you, Max, oh, very much pleasure, for coming Max. over and it's seeing us pleasure. today. It's a pleasure. All right, Max. Thank year. you, boy. Get your bat. And thanks a lot for being with us. We enjoyed having you, and we hope you'll join us next week. Same time, same station. So long. You've been listening to another chapter of Double Play with baseball's most exciting couple, Lorraine Day and Leo DeRocher. Today, Lorraine and Leo had as their guest, Max Patkin, and here in our studios, we had our special guest, Bob Hunter. Join us when again it's time for Double Play with Leo DeRocher and Lorraine Day plus another big-time guest star. Double Play is produced by Marty Martin, directed by Ted Nealon, and is a Martez production.